time. It's great to be gathered in worship. And I really appreciated what Jonathan shared in our meditation for communion, that we need to get refocused. In fact, that's the purpose of this series, Unprecedented, is to look at what's truly unprecedented and to refocus on those things that God has, has done for us. Today we're in Colossians chapter 2, and I wanted to start with a couple of things before we got into the message. So while you're turning your Bibles or pulling up your device, Colossians 2 is where you can turn to. Um, number one, this Wednesday is November 11th. whoop de doo November 11th. Back in 1918, November 11th at 11 a.m. was a crucial, critical time for American history because that was the day at the end of World War I that the armistice was signed. The end of World War I happened at 11, 11, 11 a.m. And ever since that day, we have been honoring the veterans of our military on November 11th just as a remembrance of what they've done to sacrifice for our company, country. Back in May, we celebrated Memorial Day to celebrate the people that gave their life for our country. Today, on, on Wednesday, November 11th, we celebrate the veterans that serve our country. So whether you're online or whether you're here, if you're a veteran of this country, I know you do not like standing. I know you do not like recognition. But we would like to thank you. So if you're a veteran, would you please stand for us? Caesar, you're standing in the back. I can see you in the sound. But the rest of you, would you mind please standing so we can honor you and the veterans that have served our country? Yeah. Thank you so much for your service. Today, on Wednesday, I encourage you to make an action note to honor a veteran. Somebody in your family, somebody in your neighborhood, somebody in your friends, workplace, or whatever, but thank them for their service because without it, we're not a free country and we are grateful for them. Second thing you might want to know about is, I've been asked about, why the beard? I am not a beard guy. I don't wear them very often, but I've been asked by a few men over the years to honor November as no shave November. Now, I just realized this morning after talking about it that the, re the people that keep asking me to do that all have beards. So, they want me to join them, I think. But the reason we celebrate No Shave November is to honor those that have struggled with cancer. So they lose hair in the fight against cancer, and so wearing hair is a reminder of what they suffer, what they go through to fight cancer. And you don't have to do No Shave November to honor somebody and appreciate somebody that's fighting that battle. Diane and I have had a number of friends, family members over the years, especially recently, that have been dealing with cancer. So I'm wearing the beard for No Shave November for them. There you go. No, I, I just want you to see that. It may come off this week because our granddaughter gets married on Friday and I'm doing the wedding, so I might be shaving that off um, to celebrate that. Enough of that. I learned a new word this year. Last week we talked about unprecedented and what it means. I have a new word for you today. It's actually not a word, it's an acronym. And I heard it from a young person and I realized it's part of their lingo. And maybe you young people in this room can appreciate this one. The word I heard this year was FOMO. Anybody know what, anybody hear the word FOMO before? Some of you older people know, but a lot of you younger people know. FOMO is an acronym. It stands for fear of missing out. And the person that brought it up to me was talking about the things that they've missed out on because of the pandemic this year. I think our culture and our world is suffering from FOMO. We've been missing out. Come on. Missed out on a vacation. Missed out on a marriage wedding ceremony. Missed out on an event that you were going to. Missed out on Disneyland. Oh my gosh. <laughs> missed out on sports. Missed out on activities. Missed out on family times. Missed, missed out on school with your friends. Missed out on work environment opportunities. And on and on it goes. And we're all suffering from this FOMO disease. Can I get an amen listening online? Today I want to talk about the fact that you have a full life, not a FOMO life, out of Colossians chapter 2. I was reading about a story from Leith Anderson. He's a pastor in the East Coast. He's, he's served for many years, written many good books. And, and one of the things he tells about is a story when he was a kid. He's a baseball nut. And when he grew up, they didn't have the L.A. Dodgers. They had the Brooklyn Dodgers. Dodgers. It was before they moved out to LA, and that was his favorite baseball team, and the Brooklyn Dodgers got to go to the World Series to play for the pennant, 
and they were playing those dreadly, dastardly Yankees. Somehow, Leith's dad was able to get two tickets to go to World Series Game 1 for his famed Brooklyn Dodgers. He was so excited he got to go see his Brooklyn. He knew the Brooklyn Dodgers were going to knock those Yankees right off the ballpark. But he shows up, and he's watching the game, and his famed Brooklyn Dodgers never even got on base. He was so disappointed they lost the game. He didn't even realize what he had just witnessed. And later on, he's telling a friend of his as an adult about this experience when he was a kid and how he missed out on watching his Brooklyn Dodgers score or even get on base that day. And the guy just got these huge eyes. He was a baseball nut as well. And he's listening to this. He's going, I can't believe you were at the game. You were at the game. What are you talking about, Leith says. You were at the game where the Yankees had a pitcher by the name of Don Larson, and he pitched the only perfect game in World Series history. It was a perfect game, and you were there. He goes, oh, I didn't even notice. I just knew my Dodgers didn't win. Friends, there are so many things that go on around our lives, and we get so focused on the wrong thing thing, what we think we're missing out on, what we think we need, what we think we wish for, and we miss out on what God is really doing around our lives and in our lives. And that's what Paul is going to talk about. You have been given a full life. And I want you to see that today. It's in Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to pick it up at verse 6. Listen to what he says. Here's the secret to a full life. Listen to this verse. So then, he tells the Colossian church, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Everybody say, in him. In him. That's how you have your full life. Just as Jesus became your Lord, now he becomes your life. And live your life in him. See, he's telling this to the Colossian church. And you can appreciate the Colossian church because they are having a little bit of FOMO in their lives too. They live in the middle of Asia. They're on the trade route that leaves the port cities over in Europe and moves towards Eastern Asia. And this city was really powerful and and profitable for a long time. And now they're in a period of decline. The church is feeling that stress. They're financially under persecution. They have legalism happening in the church about you need to do it this way, you need to do these rules, you need to do these things. Boy, if they had to wear masks at that time, this church would have been exploding from the rules. And not only that, then they're surrounded by immorality around the communities that was tearing at the church trying to get them to compromise. And here's this church is trying to struggle to survive in a town that's trying to struggle to survive. And they're all feeling like, well, we're not like Europe. We're not like Ephesus. We're not like Athens. We don't have the blessings of these other places. We're just this little old bitty town named Colossae. Oh, woe is us. We're missing out. And Paul says, no, you're not. You've been given a gift. Your life is full because you have Jesus. That's what makes your life full. And what he's telling them is, instead of focusing on what you've experienced in the past, and instead of worrying about what might happen in the future, enjoy what Jesus has given you now. That's why I brought my glasses here. You know, God... We start our life like an empty glass. We're we're just an empty life God created. The fact that you're breathing and alive is a gift of God. Yeah, can I get an amen from all of you for that, even at home? You are alive. That's a gift from God. And not only that, but then he pours things into our life and fills our life with blessing. And when you gave your life to Jesus, that's what he poured into your life. The Spirit is in your life. But you know what? Just like Colossae, we like to focus on what's missing. Don't we? Oh, I I need more. Like, I have more room in my cup. I got more opportunity. I'm missing out on things that I wish I had. And that's what that church is doing. And he's saying, no, you need to focus on what you have and live in that moment. That's a full life. And that's what he's telling the church to do. You've been given Jesus, and now not only have you Jesus, but if you live in him, your life will be full. And then he says three ways that that happens. Look at verse 7 with me. Here's what you need to do, church, to keep a full life. Number one, 
Be rooted and built in Him. Number two, be strengthened in your faith as you were taught. And number three, overflow with thanksgiving for what He's doing. Be rooted in Him. Strengthen yourself in faith and overflow in thanksgiving. Now, I want to break those down with you for the rest of the passage to show you three practices that help you live a full life today, right now. Not worrying about a pandemic, not worrying about what's going on next year, next month, not worrying about a new president or a new Congress or whatever, not worrying about the governor, not worrying about your work, not worrying about your life. I want you to experience full life today. Three practices to do that. Number one, be rooted in him. Look at verse 8. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. See to it that nothing takes you captive, but base your life on Christ instead of the world. See, there's two competing forces there that Paul's talking about. The world is trying to tell you what you need to live. The world is trying to tell you how to fill your cup. And Christ is saying, no, I'm already in your cup. You need to stay rooted in me, not worry about what the world tells you. See, the world loves to tell you what you're supposed to be. They want to give you your identity. They want to tell you how to fill your schedule. They want to to grow your desires and wishes so you pursue the things you want. And you know what it does? It just sucks the energy out of your life. But Jesus came and he said, no, that's not what I want to do. I want you to become your identity that I created you to be. I I want you to reduce, listen, reduce your schedule. Take stuff out of your schedule. I know you just like, oh, my cup's going to get lower. I want you to rest in what I'm giving you. Not only that, I want you to grow contentment because then you're going to be happier with what you have. And I want to fill your energy. Don't you forget what Jesus said, if you obey my word and do what I say, I will give you truth and the truth will set you free. Not captive, but free. And then he says, when he says, I came to give you life and life to the fullest. See, we get so enamored by what we need or what we think we need and what we think we're missing out on that we miss out on the life God's already given us. The way you solve that is to, first of all, root yourself in his word. Root yourself. That illustration comes from a tree. Because you know how this works, right? Trees, science lesson number 101 here today. Trees, what you see above the ground is happening below the ground. The taller the tree above ground, the deeper the tree below ground. The roots have to match what's above the ground or the wind and the storms and the rain and all the elements, the wind of Tracy will knock that tree over. All trees are like that except for one. There's one tree that roots different. And you live in California, so you've seen them. They're called the sequoia tree. The sequoia tree, as tall as they get, do not go deeper in their root. The sequoia tree is made to spread out its roots across the ground. And they can't grow alone. They have to grow in an orchard or a forest because they tie their roots around the other roots of the tree. And that creates more strength than digging deep on their own. Their root system is so intertwined that they can grow much taller and live much longer than a normal tree because their root system is firmly established with others. Friends, do you realize that's a blessing from God in your life? You're rooted together. You're rooted together. You're rooted together. You're rooted together. You're ro- and not only that, we are rooted together as the body of Christ. And not only that, worldwide, You are rooted together under the word of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. You are rooted together and it gives you strength to survive the storms. That's how you live a full life. Not only that, look at what he says next. Verse 9, for in Christ, in Jesus, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. 
Everything that makes God is found in Jesus. We talked about that last week. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. You, me, full because of Jesus. Now, what's he talking about when my cup is half full? Well, here's the thing. When we say fullness, we think more. Like, all right, Thanksgiving's coming up. Come on, how many of you on Thanksgiving sit down at the table and eat the most you'll eat all year long on that meal? Come on. You'll keep eating more and more and more until you're so what? Full. And two hours later, oh, I'm so full. Where's the pie? Because for us, full is more. You go to a stadium for a concert. You don't want to go to a stadium that has 30 people in it. You want to go to a stadium, a worship concert, or a fun concert when the thing is full, more. And I could go on and on. Great example in my house. Diana says, take out the trash. And I said, no, 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 there's room for more. It's not full yet. That's how we think of full. But when you read fullness in this scripture, he's not talking about more. He's not saying you have to fill your cup up with more. What he's saying is you have received completeness. It's not about how much you have, it's how pure what you have is. It's not about how much your life grows and becomes for yourself. It's about what I do in your life. That is full. And you know what? More gets in the way of better. You can have more stuff around your house that gets in the way of what's better for your house. You can have more things in your schedule and it can get in the way of what's better for your life. And you can have more activities and fun and enjoyment in your life and it destroys your life because you're not getting better. And Jesus didn't come to give us more. He came to make us better. And that's what he gives you. And that's incredible. You know what happens when you receive Jesus' better? It strengthens your faith in him. We'll talk about this in December. There's a difference between faith and hope. Faith is believing the promiser. Hope is believing his promises. So the stronger we get in believing Jesus, the stronger our faith is. Kind of like you're rooted in the word, you grow stronger by believing in him. And what he's saying here is, when you believe in what he's giving, you will get better because he proves faithful. I was reading the story of Stuart McAllister. Stuart had this passion for Czechoslovakia. So what he would do during the time when the country was shut out from Christians is he would pack up suitcases full of Bibles and Christian literature, fly to Austria, cross the border with this luggage, and then give those materials out to the churches so they would have Bibles and things to study from. Well, one of those trips when he was packing his luggages, he got pulled over by the border patrol was discovered with the literature and was immediate thro immediately thrown into a Czechoslovakian jail. He had no touch with the outside world, no idea how long he was going to be there, shut up in a, sh in a cell, only got food and water, never saw anybody for weeks. And he thought that was it. Thought his life was over. Thought, why did I do this, Jesus? Where's your protection? Why aren't you doing this? Are you really there? Do you really hear me? Two weeks into that incarceration, somebody showed up at the door, opened the door, the guard grabbed him up out of the cell, walked him out the building, out the fences, and threw him out the gate. And he was released. And he said, of all the experiences I've ever had in my life, the one thing that grew my faith more was going through that jail time. Because it proved to me in the worst of times that God is still in control. Can I suggest to you today that God has been making you and I better this year? Maybe he's working on, instead of giving you more in your life, maybe he's working on giving you better in your life. 
Maybe he's working on growing your family better instead of giving you more. Maybe he's trying to work on using the resources better instead of trying to spend more. Maybe he's trying to do something in your faith to make you better in your belief in him instead of just giving you more to make you happy. That's why Paul tells the church, root yourself in the word, grow stronger in your faith and you will find fullness. Third thing he says, and this is the most fun of all. (laughs) I mean, just grab hold of this verse, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins, you and I, dead, and in his uncircumcision of our flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He did it. And not only that, he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. And he's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And then having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them with the cross. See, here's what he's saying. You've been given the greatest gift of all in your life. See, not only were you given life, but he keeps giving you life in your life. And he keeps filling up your cup. And here's the problem. We look at that emptiness and think, well, I got to have more. Oh, it's not good enough, God. It's not what is appropriate. And we make this decision. Oh, it's just a little sin. It won't hurt anything. Everybody else is doing it. The world says it's okay. I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can just pour it into my life. And this is our life, dead to sin, corrupted by the world, reduced to an unholy mixture that doesn't matter how filled you make your life, it's still dead for eternity. But Jesus said, I'm not having that. You know what he did? It's the beauty of this story. He says, I I don't want this for you. I'm going to take it from you. And so by nailing himself to the cross, oh, I forgot, this is my cup and Greg's. After nailing himself and pouring more of his blood on us, he washes it clean. And not only that, and this is what the passage is saying, not only that, he says, okay, I'm not done yet. Yes, we've washed the blood. Your blood has cleansed you from sin. But I'm going to keep pouring blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing, after blessing, I hope this doesn't burn me, after blessing, after blessing, and you keep saying, oh, I want more, oh, I don't like that, that's not the blessing I want, no, I'm going to keep pouring more, and giving you more, and making you better, and making you pure, and making you clean. That's what he's giving you. You are full, complete, perfected, Why would we think that sin is worth pursuing? Why are we so upset about what we're missing out on when you've been giving the complete, pure love of Jesus? I want you to hear that today. Because so many of us are struck and infected by the disease of FOMO. We're so afraid we're going to miss out on something that we pursue the wrong things and it ends up corrupting our life. But Jesus wants to give you completeness, perfection, joy, contentment, Sabbath, love. And you know what the beauty is? And I'll just do one more thing with this. You know what the beauty is? When Jesus keeps pouring in me and I'm thankful for it, it just pours right out onto the rest of the world all the blessings he keeps pouring into our lives. Church, listen to me. You do not suffer from FOMO. You should be celebrating in thanksgiving. The church this Thanksgiving, this season, this month, should be the most thankful of all. We should be telling the world how blessed we are, not what we missed out on. Because Jesus 
has filled our life with his blessing. My challenge to you the rest of this month is to tell everybody else how full you are. We say this word, think about it. We say this word, oh, I'm so thankful. Really? I'm thankful, but I'm thankful, well, no, no. I'm so full of thanksgiving because of what Jesus keeps pouring into my life. Tell somebody that. Share that with a friend. Share it with a neighbor. Tell your family. Let's be people that overflow with thanksgiving because of what Jesus keeps pouring into our life. Amen? Amen. That's what Jesus and Paul are telling the church in Colossae. And I would just bet that if he gave us a message today, he'd tell us the same thing too. (laughs) I don't know if you remember the name Corey Ten Boom. She was, in, she was captured as a Jew, sent to a concentration camp with her sister, Betsy. They were in Ravensbrück for many months and years, and they were in this, in this dorm, if you will, in the encampment, enslaved by the German forces. And Betsy and Corey somehow, I don't know how they did it, but somehow they were able to smuggle in a Bible into their dorm and have the word of God to share with the women in their dorm. What was so interesting in their story was Betsy, the older sister of Corey, told her sister, the scripture says right here, we need to be thankful in everything. Corey says, no, I'm not thankful for this. I'm not thankful for this situation. I'm not thankful for what's going on around us. And I'm certainly not thankful for the fleas that live in our dormitory. Betsy told her, you need to be thankful for the fleas. Would you be thankful for fleas? It was infesting the dorm. What they discovered a couple months later, they realized theirs was the only dormitory of women that didn't have rapes, didn't have have molestation, didn't have angry guards come in and beat them. The guards stayed away from the dorm because of the fleas. (laughs) Betsy and Corey realized, thank you, God, for the fleas that protected our life. I will thank him every day. I want to suggest to you, you're starting to feel a little FOMO in your life. Thank God for your fleas. No, really. Thank him for those. Because that emptiness reminds us to focus on what he's given. And God, I just pray today that we would be thankful people celebrating the fullness that you've given us in our life, celebrating the completeness that you've given to us through Jesus. We want to be people that are known to be thankful for the cross and for what it gives us. Help us to be those people by rooting us in your word and growing a strength in our circumstances and especially just helping us to overflow with thanksgiving for the cross. Let it be known this season that believers are thankful, not fearful. And may you get all the praise for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen.